Hey there. I want to talk to you today about virality. Fact, we share over 2.8 billion communicative nodes a day. And that's just Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Now these communicative nodes usually take form of a message, a product, an idea, a story. And when these nodes spread from person to person to person over a short period of time, they're said to have gone viral. And the allure of going viral is super compelling. I mean, look, let's keep it real. Especially if you're a marketer, an artist, or an advertiser, you mean to tell me that my idea is going to get seen by a million people, then they're going to share it with people that I don't even know? That sounds like a good deal to me. But it begs the question, in today's hyper-connected world, where things spread at a rate far greater than ever before, is there something more powerful, more compelling than going viral? So this provocation, somehow or another, led me to the movie Avatar. Stick with me, guys. I know, I know, I know. Avatar. Avatar is the highest grossing movie ever made. It's been seen the world over. One may even say it's gone viral. Now, despite the fact that I've seen Avatar three times, I could not for the life of me remember the lead character's name. And when I ask people who've seen the movie as well, it's like, yo, do you know that guy's name? They're like, nah, man, I can't remember the guy's name either. And I wouldn't be surprised if you're sitting there thinking, what is that dude's name? <laughs> but juxtapose the movie Avatar with the movie Frozen. Now, I've never seen Frozen, hand to God, never seen Frozen, but I know the lead character's name, Elsa. I know the storyline. I know the words to let it go. <laughs> in fact, listen, if I'm in a conversation with someone unrelated to the movie and they say let it go in a sentence, in my mind all I hear is let it go, let it go. It's probably no wonder then why the Frozen soundtrack went number one on Billboard with no radio play. Or also that let it go was number one most requested song at karaoke in 2014. Oh, oh yeah, and Elsa, the number one Halloween costume in 2014, and among the top baby names in 2014, and so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. See, while Frozen went on to be the most successful animated movie, it did more than just get seen a lot. It did more than just go viral. It had an impact on culture. And this impact was contagious. Much in the way that somehow or another we all just started saying on fleek or turn up, or Netflix and chill, or it seemingly everybody last year was dabbing, or doing the mannequin challenge, or in November we grow mustaches. See, much like the movie Frozen, these things not only spread from person to person to person, but they took hold in culture. They were adopted into culture, impacting our beliefs, the artifacts that we don, the behaviors we take on, and the language that we use. They were culturally contagious. And from this perspective, cultural contagion is far, far, far greater than going viral. Far more powerful than getting seen a lot. And this provocation set the stage for new exploration. See, I found myself being ridiculously curious about understanding the dynamics of cultural contagion. Because if I can understand, rather if we can understand, why things not only spread from person to person to person, but impact our beliefs, the behaviors we take on, the artifacts that we don, and the language that we use, then perhaps then we can build and design ideas that are culturally contagious as well. So, my collaborator Chaucer Barnes and I, we set out to study the world of cultural contagion. We looked at some of the biggest cultural happenings over the course of 20 years, from 1995 to 2015. Everything from fashion to advertising to memes or to the fact that we wore Livestrong bracelets before we realized that Lance Armstrong was a dirtbag. <laughs> and the hope is that we might be able to see some consistency, some through line between each one of these cases, each one of these cultural happenings so that we might be able to identify causality as to why things not only spread from person to person, but take hold in culture, impacting our beliefs, the artifacts that we don, the behaviors that we do, and the language that we take on. So, while this happened, we ended up finding something, fortunately. Well, in fact, we found five things. 
five conditions that were consistent in each one of these happenings. The first was the communicative node, the content, the idea. And the idea was built to share. The content was communicative by design. The second, not only was the idea built to share, communicative by design, it was shared by the appropriate messenger, someone with credence, someone that I trusted. Three, the idea, the content, was also enabled for thematic iteration. And that is, some individual can uniquely express the idea with some derivative work without degradating the integrity of the original idea. We notice, we think about covers, music covers, right? Someone remakes a song, different artist, different arrangement, different key, but we still know the original song. My mind goes to the Fugees and Killing Me Softly. So we got content, we got credence, we got covers. The fourth, fertile conditions. And this speaks to the marketplace conditions that can't be controlled, they can't be predicted, but they can be exploited by identifying someone in the market who could benefit from your idea winning, your compliment. Think peanut butter and jelly. If peanut butter is having a good year, jelly is going to benefit also. So they're both invested in each other's success. The fifth was this idea of perceived ubiquity. Perceived ubiquity in the marketplace, what we call concurrence where it seemed like everybody was talking about it or everybody was doing it. Because if everybody's talking about it and everybody was doing it, it lowers resistance. And we take a look to see, what is everybody talking about? What's all the hoopla about? And the alchemy of these five conditions create the perfect recipe for cultural contagion. It increases the likelihood that ideas not only spread from person to person to person, but catch hold in culture impacting our beliefs, the artifacts that we've done, the behaviors we take on, and the language that we use. And collectively, we call this the Contagion Cookbook. Content, credence, covers, compliments, and concurrence. Now, it's important that I note that this was a discovery. It wasn't an invention. As my collaborator would say, this wasn't Walter White's blue meth. We found this in the wild, right? It was a discovery. In fact, the closer we got to understand the dynamics of cultural contagion, the further we dug into the conditions of the cookbook, we found that it mirrored closely to the conditions of epidemiological spread, how pathogen spreads from person to person to person. So the content, the communicative node, the idea, well, that's like the pathogen itself. And the pathogen has the properties that are communicative, that are easily to transmit. And not only does it have communicative properties, but it's spread by the appropriate messenger, someone I trust, someone close to me in proximity, both physically and intimately. When we think about thematic iterations, covers, and epidemiology, it's sort of like strand mutation, where the pathogen takes on a different shape, a different expression, a different form based on your resistance. Then we think about fertile conditions, complements. It's kind of like the right season. In the fall, we call it flu season, right? Kids are going back to school, they come home, they're walking Petri dishes, right? Our office places, our, 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 our workplaces are far more dense because people are less likely to go on vacation in the fall, right? The weather is changing, so our body is allocating energy to regulate temperature, which leaves our immune system potentially compromised. These things create the perfect conditions for pathogens to spread. And then there's perceived ubiquity, concurrence which is sort of like controlled air spaces. It's the four walls, both figuratively and literally, that we find ourselves in. An airplane, our offices, our classrooms. If there's a high incidence of the pathogen within these closed air spaces, i.e., there are a high percentage of people who happen to have the pathogen, and they communicate it, they cough, they sneeze, it increases the probability that we'll be exposed. And the alchemy of these five conditions create the perfect recipe for pathogens to spread from person to person to person, and take hold, much like the five conditions of cultural contagion. Increases the probability that ideas not only spread from person to person, but take hold. And from that perspective then, cultural contagion is far greater than going viral and way more compelling than getting seen by a whole bunch of folks. Because if we can design ideas that are culturally contagious, 
Imagine what it means in the context of education. Imagine what it means in the context of public health, of public policy. Imagine what it means for our interaction with the environment. Because if we can come up with ideas, messages, products, behaviors that not only spread from person to person, but take hold in culture, impacting people's beliefs and the behaviors they take on, we can positively impact humanity. And we all can do it. The recipe's here. So imagine what it means for your ideas. Imagine what it means for your cause. Consider your blueprint. Because with this idea, we can literally design messages, products, ideas, and behaviors that can literally change the world. And that, I think, is an idea worth spreading. Thank you so much.